Hey, um, I, want to, I want to open this morning by sharing something personal, a personal story with you, and it's germane to the, our teaching time. But last week, most of you know that we weren't here. And uh, when we go out, when Ann and I go out, we, we make sure that we visit other churches, and we had been planning uh, on Saturday morning where we were going to go to church on Sunday. And so we had gone and we had done our mapping getting, so we knew where we were going to be going. And then it was time for breakfast. And it's a long story about how the Lord got us here, but uh, got us to the place we, were, we ended up. But we ended up at Waffle House. And everybody here in, in uh, Texas knows the beauty, the magnificence of Waffle House, right? <laughs> One of my favorite places to have breakfast. But unfortunately, most Waffle Houses are very small. And this place was jammed. And it doesn't take a lot to jam them normally, but it was jammed with two pages of names of people who were waiting. So at first, we're all kind of standing up against the wall in this big crowd of people, and then as people were getting seated, we finally made our way to sit down against the wall. And there were a couple of chairs on the, on the side of me. Anne was here. I was sit, seated here. And then a lady came and sat down next to me, and then the seats next to her opened up, so her husband made his way down. And just as he got to me, and he was a big guy, just as he got to me, she shifted over a seat, and when he sat down, he sat down and took up about this much of me. <laughs> and I looked over at him like this, and I mean, obviously you could tell. The chairs, I'm sure, came from the children's department. Um, so he sat down, and I just kind of slugged him in the arm. And I knew I was okay, because Ann was with me, and no one would beat me up while Ann is there. <laughs> so I, I slugged him in the arm, and I playfully said, I guess this is so we get to know one another. And he looked over at me, kind of looking quizzically for just a moment. And he goes, yeah, this is, it's kind of tight, isn't it? So we talked a little bit. And, and then they got up and finally got their seat. It took about 20 minutes for them uh, to get their seat. We had been there for a total of 35 minutes uh, to get breakfast. So they went to a different part of the restaurant, and we were still waiting for our name to be called. And you know how you do when you're sitting in line. You're, you're looking to see who's going so that no one gets ahead of you. And there were people trying to get ahead of the list. And we're like going, the winks don't work. We can see you winking. They're winking at the hostess, like give us a seat. So anyway, as, I, as I'm sitting there, I look over, and, and his wife has shifted to the other side and to see the next to him, and he's waving at us like this. And, and I said, they're, they're, I said, Ann, they're inviting us to come have breakfast with them at their table. And before I said yes, I asked permission. Ann gave, said, yes, you can, we can. So we got up and we went over there and sat down with them. What happened after that, we really understood why God was moving us all around that morning to end up at that particular place. As we sat down and listened to their story and we were sharing our story, there were so many points of similarity that we were able to speak into their lives about our similar experiences. The, the lady didn't know who her, her mother was and had, had, you know, didn't know who her daddy was. And so they were able to, we were able to be uh, empathetic and sympathetic with that. We shared about several different things about work and about life and about kids. And, and then they asked you know, the, the typical question, so what do you do? And I said, I, I pastor a church in, in, in south, of, south of Houston. And I said, we've been there for 35 years, and answering the question. And I said, and i got to just tell you, it's been a honeymoon for 35 years. And he asked us to explain a little bit about that. And then as we got through talking about church dynamics, I said, yeah, you know what's different about our place is that where most churches have the pastor up here, then the leadership, and then the people down here. I said, in our church, the pastors and the leaders, we're down here. And we're doing all we can to push people up into their ministry, into the life that God has for them. It was at that point that I teared up and then he teared up, this big trucker, over the road trucker. I teared up, he teared up. And I realized something right then. That as I got a fix on who you are and what we're really about, I felt so privileged to, be, to, to know that God has set us here to do one thing. And that's to push you up into your ministry to push you up into a place where you are bearing much fruit, thereby showing that you are his disciples. And I want you to know that Ann and I, during that discussion, during that moment, that God moment with those people, that we realized that, that we were privileged to be the ones who are here week after week. And I'm telling you the story because I want you to know I'm, I'm renewed with a sense of what my job is to do here and how important it is to do it now. 
You see, it's important to, to me and to you to understand that what we gather for is not so that we can leave here with the personal inspiration that we have to make us feel good about ourselves, but to equip us to get a hold of the Word of God so that we can go out and we can meet life head on and we know how to answer the questions and we know how to bring comfort and we know how to bring hope into helplessness and we know how to bring order out of chaos. The Bible tells us clearly that in the times that we're living in, that there'll be people who will not endure sound teaching, that they will be, have itching ears and will look for people to say what they, they want to hear them say, but there's gonna be a group of people, there's always been a remnant of God's people who are willing to stand up and speak the truth in love, seasoned with grace, to make a difference in the world around them. Amen. And that needs to be us. Yes. Yes. So today I, I'm starting this new leg of our series. It's still titled the same, but you know that we're done with 10 weeks of study of the theories and the concepts and the precepts of discipleship. And now we're moving into the practices, the practices of discipleship. And I'm gonna start with one that I'm almost positive that you're not anticipating. Because it's never been th thought of in the terms of this is the fundamental root of all discipleship. But as I prepared, I realized we can't do any of the things that we even expect to study, we can't study those without getting this. And so this morning I wanna take you right to the beginning of the Bible. Who can, who can get any farther back than the, the first couple of pages? And I wanna to read to you this passage of scripture. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over all the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And look at it. And subdue it and have dominion. So I want you to see that all rulership from the creation of humanity was that rulership, which comes from discipleship, which comes from submitting ourselves to God, that it all was meant to flow from the unit of the family. The husband and the wife being together. The husband and wife bearing children and being fruitful and multiplying. And I want you to understand that from the very beginning, we see God as our mentor and his people who were Adam and Eve as disciples, his personal disciples and followers, and they were given the rule over all the earth. But it was from this platform of male and female, man and woman, husband and wife, and as long as the earth exists, the New Testament teaches, there will be marriage between a man and a woman who have sons and daughters. I want you to understand, before we make one move for, forward, ministry, the result of good discipleship, was meant to flow from family. Meant to flow from family. Now the minute I say that, already I just almost lost a third of the congregation. But I'm gonna catch you before you hit the bottom and dial out. So here's what I want you to see. If ever you and I are gonna be good disciples, we're gonna build strong family, but it doesn't exclude at-home singles. See, right now, people were starting to say, oh, he's gonna talk about family. Well, I'm single, that checks me out. I might, should have stayed home today and watched something on TV. I want you to note that you're still living at home. If you are a young person and you are still under the authority and rule of your parents, you've never been married, you're still in your, your parents' household, you need to build a strong relationship with your parents and with your siblings. That's the way life was meant to run. They are your Adelphos, and the scripture is, is clear as a bell of how we're to re relate relationally, and the Bible is also clear on how we're to relate to those who birthed us and brought us into the world. So I want you to know if that you're living in, in your home and you want to be a good disciple and you're a single, a young single, still under the authority of your parents, here's what the scripture says. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, and it is well pleasing to the Lord. If you are a young single, here is your job if you want to be a good disciple. 
You build a strong relationship with your mom and dad. You resist the temptation to argue against them, to rebel against them. You work through things with them, and you, you maintain a great and a strong relationship with your siblings here because you will need them in the future. Are we together? So singles, dial back in. What we're, we're, where we're about to go is going to have a lot to do with you. But there's another group here in our midst as well. And it's the group of people who are older, they are single, they are either unmarried because they, they never got married, but they're on their own, they're their own responsibility, or they have found themselves divorced, or they have found themselves widowed, or they are widowers. And I want you to know that this is for you as well. So I need you to stay dialed in. Since Jesus is the head of the church, like the husband is the head of the wife, I want you to understand that as long as you are single, he is your family leader, he is your family covering, and he is your partner in discipleship and ministry. So stay dialed in. You're part and parcel of where we're going with this today. Not only that, I want you to build a strong relationship, an intimate relationship with him so that you can know and care for the things of the Lord, how you can please him. When you study 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you'll find out that those who are unmarried can care for the things of the Lord, but those who are married are called to care for the things of their partners. Are we together? Now, I'm going to take this aside number two, and we're going to square it, because I still need to talk to you who are older, singles, unmarried, divorced, widows, and widowers. It is still true that it is not good for man to be alone. If this was a marriage seminar, I would take you through all the New Testament scriptures and I would outline the age brackets for you, but there are widows and widowers that are of a certain age that, that can, if they apply themselves to being prayer, people of prayer, that they have a service in the kingdom of heaven to perform, but anyone under a certain age still is being called to recognize the scripture, it's not good for you to be alone. There's a natural thing that happens in us as younger people under 60 that the Bible is clear about that it's still, that verse of scripture is still in force. Not good. God has an idea, has a plan for you. But many people who would like to be married are still single because they're marryable but not marriageable. And the difference is vast. The difference between those two, being marryable and marriageable, is the difference between success and joy for the latter part of your life or misery and failure. And the, the testament to the truth of this is we have many people who've been married over and over and over again who've never become marriageable, who are still repeating a cycle that is bringing them misery. And yet God has a plan. And if you're single... And under a certain age, God has a plan for you to be fulfilled and to enjoy your life with a partner. Over the past and free for the future are two totally different things. A person can say, well, you know, I, I was married and that was really a bad relationship, but I'm over it, so now I'm ready to get married again. That's not the same thing as being free for the future with someone else. And I want to talk to you about that for just a moment so that we can move together into this thing and pull from the scriptures what we need to be doing. So let's talk about marriable versus marriageable for just a moment. Marriable means that you want to be married, you don't want to be alone, and you're old enough to get, your, to get a license and you have the ability to go get a license. Marriable means that you don't want to be alone, that you want a partner to do life with and share some stuff with. Marriable means that because you are established, and this is a huge stumbling block, that because you are established, even if not healed, you are ready to move from the past into the future. And that one word, that one word, established, is the word that's causing you to stumble or prohibiting you from finding the perfect will of God for your life. You see, marriageable means that regardless of where you are now, you are ready to go all the way back to where you are fully ready to be remeshed with another person. 
that is different than being partnered with a person. Let me explain what I mean. Marriageable means that you're willing, once again, to be made one flesh. One flesh. Now, the Bible calls that a mystery that has to be understood, has to be explained. And here, here is the mystery in a nutshell. It's not a marriage seminar. If it was, I'd take you through all of it. But this is, this is all you need to understand. There's a beautiful baby boy, an adult baby boy, and an adult baby girl, and they want to be married. I mean, they got it going on. And this is what marriage looks like to God. The two become meshed. Little baby blue, little pink, little baby girl come together, fully meshed, and they create a new color called purple. There is a meshing of two souls to become one. Now, the Bible is really clear about this, that in the beginning, God made man and squeezed him from clay, and then he crafted a woman. The two parts going together to make one perfect individual in God's sight. And it's by ignoring this truth that most divorces happen. Most divorces are the results of, of instead of working on being meshed together for a lifetime, knowing that this is God's plan for a man and a woman, something happens, and we call it something like midlife crisis. It should be the denial of God's word. Because all of a sudden, a certain time of our life, instead of working on being meshed, we begin working on finding our new identity. I've got to find myself. But God meant for marriage to be meshed. And if we had more concentration on building a strong family unit, beginning with the husband and wife partnership, if we were spending more time there, we would have a lifetime experience of a happy and fulfilling marriage. Every young couple ought to know now is the time to commit yourself to being meshed fully together. It doesn't mean you lose who you are. You're bringing your uniqueness to the marriage, but you realize that you're working together, two halves, making one perfect whole in the sight of God. This is important for everybody who's been married and, and hitting that, that dullness zone. That instead of beginning to emerge and seeking your identities and new things to experience apart from one another, you go back and you begin to rekindle the meshing of souls. And it's really important for those who are facing divorce to realize that there's still hope for you. Amen. Because what God put together like that, I'm just telling you, no man can take apart. And so every time that we do this second time, third time around, we are now meshing shades of purple. And if it's done with knowledge in Christ, you can be extremely successful in that part of your life. Are we together so far? So I want you to understand that when you come to this spot of recognizing that there's a huge difference between being marriable and marriageable, and now you can say, I am ready, I am ready. Here's what I've noticed in 45 years of doing this. Two people come together after a divorce, but both, they'll tell you, are set in their ways. So instead of meshing like, like this, they mesh like this. Part. Well, all this stuff is hanging out here. All this stuff is just waiting to create problems. And regardless of what you have in life, and you can surmise the, the, the end of that game yourself with all the accomplishments, all the, the portfolio that you've built, until you're ready to be remeshed. Our dad, who you want to lead you into relationship, is gonna be hesitant to give you to anybody or give anyone to you who's not really ready because he wants you whole and healthy and full of life and joy. Are we together? So, I can tell the room is very happy right now. So, if you want to be a good disciple, you need to build a strong family. Now, we've taken care of business with the singles. Now, let's take a look at what it looks like. Remember, it's not a marriage seminar. These are just thumbnails to get us to a point, all right? So I want to be a good disciple. How about you? Amen. Then we're going to go to work. We're going to concentrate on building a strong family. <clears throat> Husbands, love your wives. 
even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. To present it to himself a glorious church. Like that, so should men love their wives even as Christ loved his own body. You know that even as Christ has, has uh, not been fully understood because we've not taken it and brought it to the conclusion in verse 29. We stopped too soon in the study. And Jesus loved the church and strengthened the church because it was his body. And he loved his body. And he gave itself for him. You see, the scripture in the King James says, no man ever hated his own flesh, but, loved it, but nurtured it and, and took care of it. But that's not true, is it? If the point was, if the point was, love your wives like you love your body. I know a lot of guys who don't love their bodies. I can just tell you by looking at them, they don't love their bodies. Right? So the likeness to even as is not, hey, buddy, love your wife like you love your body. Well, I'll tell you what, I cheat on my body all the time. I eat ice cream a lot, too many times. But if I love my body, like Christ loved his body, it changes the whole family dynamic. And you and I, men, are being called to love our wives like Christ loved you, not how you take care of yourself. Very important distinction. Wives, submit yourselves, the determination of your will, that's actually, actually the, the, the meaning of that, of that passage of scripture. Submit the determination of your will to your own husbands as unto the Lord as is due in the Lord. I wish this was a marriage seminar right here. Because the, what this goes back to is the original curse. When Adam and Eve sinned. And the whole idea of submission has been taken out of context. You see, there are only two versions of the Bible that interpret the curse as, and now, because of sin, you will want to have ascendancy over your husband. I study with 30 different parallel versions of the Bible for every message that I prepare for, 30. Two of them, two, the, N, the N, uh, NLT and the NET versions give it that connotation that now God says, now childbearing is gonna be hard and you're gonna be at war with your husband wanting to rule over him. Only two versions of 30 say that. Here's what the whole submission thing is from the New Testament in regard to the, the curse of the Old Testament. When Eve failed, she failed because she didn't submit the determination of her will to her partner. If she had just said, Adam, Adam, look at this fruit, man. Look at this fruit. It sure looks good to eat. I really wanna take a bite. What do you think, Adam? If she had submitted the determination of her, to her partner of her will, maybe he would have talked her out of it. But because she acted autonomously to get what she wanted when she wanted it, God said, Eve, from now on, things are gonna be different. You are meant to rule and reign together, but from this point forward, by what you've done, now you're gonna have to submit your will, your determined will to your husband. Here's all that it means. Don't exclude your partner when it comes to working out the stuff that sounds so good in your head but sounds so stupid coming out of your mouth. I have those things all the time. The things that I think sometimes that I think, this is perfect, this is just great. I'll, I'll tell Ann and she'll go, what? I'll talk to Sonny. He'll say, I'm not sure. Did you just wake up from a nightmare or what? We were meant to submit ourselves to one another. You'll see that in a moment from the scripture. We were meant to submit ourselves to one another, not to be subjugated, but to be safe. So this response in the New Testament of, the, of this scripture that so many people rail against is just a matter of safety. It's not a matter of quality. Men and women Jesus, said, uh, Jesus made equals Paul recorded in two places. 
Listen, there's not, neither male nor female now in Christ. Jesus is the great equalizer. This has never been about lower quality or a weaker vessel, someone who's inferior to. This is a matter of, listen, it didn't work so well when you were on your own, so let's make sure you're submitting to, what, to, to your, your husband now, to your own husband, not someone else's husband. Amen. Submitting to your own husband and work through those things together. That's a whole different story than being subjugated to the male. How about this? Likewise, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor to your wife as a delicate vessel. Now, that word delicate, it, it, we really don't have a word for the, for the original translation that is suitable to our Western minds. King James uses the weaker vessel. Huh. Listen, anybody in here, with the, any man in here with the right mind knows that women are not weaker than men. That's why we don't have babies because they're a lot stronger than we are in certain ways. Oh, we've got the bulk. We were created, we are squeezed clay. And a lot of us are hunks, and some of us have turned into chunks, but the, 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 the theory still stands that we were created res resilient, and we've got big muscle groups. But there's no man in this room who thinks their wives are weak. Not once you've spent a day with your children and without her. Are, are you together? So the word weaker is not... Like, she's just too weak, so make sure you cover over her big, strong guy. It is, it is like we have men who are like um, big, thick clay plates that we use for everyday stuff, and then God crafted a woman. He squeezed the man, and he crafted a woman, and they're kind of like China. So the word delicate there goes to this re refinement issue, and I want you to understand something. God took the hunk and the china, and he put them together, and in his sight, it's the most beautiful thing in all creation. Because he said, this is really good. And we have to come back to acknowledging that, and you've got to work at that. You've got to struggle to work at that all the time, because you have an adversary who wants to get you away from that. Wants to distract you that your mate is actually your completer, and that you can't do what you've been called to do without them, vice versa, male or female, are we together? Come on, give me a little encouragement here. Are we together? Okay. Fathers, we're still at home. Fathers, don't frustrate your children to the point of anger. Now, if this was a parenting seminar, I would tell you that in the context, this means don't be duplicious. That's what it says. Don't be duplicious. Don't make your kids frustrated by telling them to do what you want them to do and then not doing it yourself. That's what it literally says. That it's not a matter of saying, being hard on your kid. Hey, kid, don't do that. Don't... Listen, if they're doing something wrong, tell them don't do that. But don't tell them to do something that you're not going to do because they're going to watch what you do, not what you say. So fathers, when you're at home, mothers, when you're at home, don't frustrate your kids to the point of anger, frustration, lest you discourage them. They can say, this is stupid. I don't want to have the faith of my mom and dad. They say one thing out of their mouth to their friends, and then they live a totally different way at home. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's what we're called to do. And you've got to work at that. You've got to work at husband and wife relationship. You've got to work at parent to child relationship. One generation shall praise their works to another and shall declare their mighty acts. This is the home stuff. Are we together? You've got to work at that. If you're going to be a good disciple, you've got to work at the home. Listen, next week I'm going to talk to you about what we normally think of as the very first rule of discipleship, which is the word of God. But if the word doesn't work at home... If you're, if you're always distracted by your home life, you will never know what it means to be a good disciple. You'll always be pulling away. Are we together? As the church, now we're getting into the sibling area. This is the, familiar, the, 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 relational, the blood family, and this is the relational family. As the church, we love one another as he loved us. So shall you love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. We've got to work at that, don't we? You gotta, listen, I'm going to tell you something. As, as beautiful as all of you are, I know that we have struggles together. We, we're going to have struggles if we get in the same room and we're talking about vanilla or chocolate. Yeah. And we have to work at this loving one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, this is the same word for women with their husbands. It's submit, not subjugate, but it's make sure that you're interactive. Make sure you're taking hold of the safety that is supplied by having a multitude of counselors. Are we together? How about this? Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. He is faithful who promised. 
You know what? In the, in the original text, that's, that's a parenthetical statement, just like I have it there. And you know where the biggest help you can provide another brother or sister is? By saying, stop it. Stop doubting. When has God ever lied to you? When has God ever been unfaithful? Oh, we can rec all recognize when God has not jumped through our hoops. That doesn't mean he's been unfaithful ever. God is not a man that he can lie. Amen. And sometimes it'd just be good for a brother or sister to say, stop, just stop it. You're going the wrong direction here. If something's not working, it's not because of God is unfaithful. It's because something's going on with us that we need to fix. Give me an amen. So, and let us consider one another to provoke each other to, good, to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and more as we see the day approaching. This is all stuff that requires work to build a strong family unit at home and in the body of Christ. We continue. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. I love this Lex conversion. Outdo yourselves in honoring one another. Do you know how that would change Facebook? If instead of complaining, I, you know what I hate most is those, I'll never trust again. Well, you're trusting the wrong person anyway. What were you, what were you thinking was going to happen? You're told to trust God and love people, not, not love God and trust people. Right? So, outdo yourselves in honoring one another. If it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. And that recognizes that sometimes it's not possible to live at peace with everyone. But you can still live in love with them. You can still honor them as part of the body of Christ, but you don't have to be at peace with what they're doing and what they're about and which what direction they're going. And I can tell you, you've got to know the difference between the two, right? How about this? Bear with each other and forgive any complaint you may have against one another. Forgive even as the Lord forgave you. So we see that this all requires work. Every bit of this requires work. To live in peace requires work. To forgive requires work. Oh, now, just, think, just to make sure that you don't think we, we've lost our sensibility, I, want, I gave you this little compendium, and there's several more of these, but it's not worth taking too much time with. So here we have, mark them who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites, and by good works and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the naive. Withdraw from every brother that walks disorderly not walking the tradition he received, ever learning but never arriving at the truth. I want to take a moment here to share it with you that as an ex-occultic practitioner, um, I know what this is about. I know what this is about where people move in to, to see what kind of liberty we've been given in Christ and to try to turn that liberty into bondage. We can be very skilled at twisting the truth of adding Eastern religions uh, of adding new ageism and adding the, the stuff that the world tells us is truth. And we mix it up in a bag and we pour it out. And because of that, we satisfy an appetite of having people going, oh, wow, dude, that's so deep. There's nothing deeper than the word of God. And you and I have to understand something, that though we are called to be at peace with everybody as much as is possible, there are some people that the scripture says, don't have anything more to do with them. It's right there. So we're not called to be gullible, and we're not called to be ignorant. We are called to try every spirit to see what sort it is. We are called to taste and see what is good and what is godly and what is not. And when it is consistently not, we don't accept it under the terms of, well, you know, the Bible just says I'm supposed to love everybody. You can love every human being without accepting the things that they believe that are contrary to God. I'll say it clearly for those of you who don't understand this. Far Eastern religions have nothing in common at all with Christ. New Ageism, the coexist mentality, has nothing at all to do with Christ. Christ is the one way to the Father. There are not multiple highways, and you and I are certainly not our own God. Are we together? So I want you to understand that while we're encouraged to love one another, we are also told to avoid, but not to get rid of them, not to call down fire from heaven. Jesus made a plain when he was approached by his own disciples. Hey, should we kill those guys? Jesus said, I'm not here for people to die. I'm here that they can be saved. 
So we take these group of people, and with humility, we instruct those who oppose themselves in the hope that God will grant them repentance to acknowledge the truth, thereby recovering themselves out of the snare of the devil. You and I can't recover a lot of people. They'll have to recover themselves. You know how they'll get led there? By a man or woman in Christ who knows who they are, who knows what the truth is, who speaks it in love, seasoned with grace, and lets the Lord have at it. Are you with me? How about this? If a man's overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Don't ever have the approach, well, you know what? Those guys are, are real dopes, man. Let's just get away from them. They stink. Your pride setting you up for a fall. Be careful. You are called to follow and walk in the image of the one who saved you. Now, there's even one more step here. This is, this is really necessary in our day. Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him because he followed not with us. He wasn't part of our group, not part of our denomination. And Jesus said, don't forbid him, for he that is not against us is for us. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of jokes that go around about arriving in heaven and saying, how'd they get here? <laughs> I want you to know something. There's a lot of really, really good people who love Jesus with their whole heart and soul who don't believe like you and I believe. And it's okay. You know the four squares that we have outside this building? That's what our founder decided was the baseline. Back in 1926, that's gonna be the baseline for fellowship with people of other denominations who didn't accept the charismatic perspective or anything else that we believe in. There are people who believe in different ways of baptism, who refuse to fellowship with people who have different ways to baptize. That, how silly does that get? We're baptizing people in the name of Jesus if it's sprinkling or submerging or whatever it is, get as technical as you want. Is it an essential truth? Here's four essential truths. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jesus Christ is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the healer. Jesus Christ is the returning king. If you believe those four things, we'll fellowship with you. Those are essentials. The rest of the stuff, we deal with that in love. The scripture right here is how we stop excluding people because they're not like us. You know what? My arm is nothing like my leg. But I'm glad I have them both. And my hand cannot reach my back anymore. But I'm sure glad my back is still there. Aren't you? And there are parts of my body I don't even want to look at. And I'm glad they're there. So stop excluding people. And be inclusive as long as Christ is the center of their belief. Are we together? We being many are one body in Christ, everyone members of one another, all members caring for one another, members in particular, thank you, Jesus. Our interpersonal relationships can be very hard. They can be very difficult. There's no doubt about that. Amen? No doubt about it. I mean, you put five people in a room, you can have a mess on your hands. But the reality of it is, even though it is hard, you and I, if we ever want to be good disciples, we'll go to work on it. Now, I'm going to close with this. If I was your boss at the plant or the boss in your office or the leader of your team, and I said to you, hey, men, we have a problem, you know what you'd do? You'd go to work on it. And you'd work diligently on it. And you'd work on it really hard. And you'd give it all that you had because it's your boss, and there's, your job is on the line, and money's on the line, and there's accolades on the line, and there's the praises of men on the line, and man, you would just be diligent to work on it, and you would be willing to put everything else aside to get that problem solved. Ladies, I'm not being demeaning when I use this example, but, but I've seen this in action. You got a problem at home with the kids. Somebody's laid their hands on your precious little child, or someone said something, and I want you to know something, bears robbed of their whelps have nothing on a mother who's angry. And you know how to solve a problem at home, don't you? You give it your full attention, and if your husband's there and he's not part of the solution, he's out to lunch. Because you're gonna solve that problem with everything that's within you, right? Why is it that we'll do those kinds of things with such intensity 
And then when someone says, men, you've got to work on your marriage. Ladies, you've got to work on your marriage. You've got to stay meshed. You've got to make sure that you're still in partnership with one another, still working with one another, still completing the picture with God with one another. Why well, we go, well, you know, but they've got a problem. They don't want to do what I want to do. And then we leave it at that and walk away. I want you to know you're opening the door. Opening the door for a struggle of life that you do not want to be involved with. That's where adultery comes in. That's where separation comes in. That's where temptation get, gets hold of us. And that's where failure happens. Work on your family relationships. Build a strong family. Now, this is a little overdramatic. I'm going to end with this. It's overdramatic. I'm telling you in advance. Because it's rough. There's a meme going around Facebook right now. And it says something on the order of this. I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I would have put it up, if, but it's still probably too rough. It said, you will know nothing about the love of God until you can sit down to dinner with your Judas. I'm not implying that your husband or wife or your children are your Judas. But if Jesus could love his betrayer, you and I can love one another with the love that he can give. If we work to build a strong family. So vitally important. There will be no good disciples without coming from a platform of a good, strong family foundation. Now obviously, family dynamics change, kids grow up, move out, they're on their own. That's not your, not your, your problem. But you make sure that wherever the lines of spiritual authority lie, that you are doing everything you can to make those bonds secure. Are we together? Let's stand up. So Father, we're asking you today for an anointing to break every yoke of bondage that we have found creeping into our lives. We have husbands and wives, parents and children. We have brothers and sisters in the body of Christ in this room that have been rent. They've been ripped, they've been torn, they've been hurt. And, and we have failed to respond in the way that you would have us to do that. So today we are gonna commit ourselves and all that's within us to getting the relationships that we have right. In some cases, Father, the house has burnt so far to the ground that there really isn't a, a whole lot we can do about that. But we can build another house. We can start again with the truth of the word of God that you have good plans for us and that those good plans include partnerships. Um, Father, there are some cases where there's been some harsh words spoken that can't be taken back, but there can also now come words that would rebuild and encourage and bring healing. And I pray that we would give ourselves to the process of developing strong family units so that in the days that are ahead of us, as good discipleship turns us into good followers, as it makes us good ministers of your life and of your word to a world that's dying, I pray that in the days ahead, we'll find ourselves marching on the front lines together with multitudes of people of like mind. And the Bible calls us to that, to look and see who's running the same race toward the same great king and to link up with them. I'm asking you today to set us free in new territory. Bring to fullness the plans you have for us. And we worship and praise you in advance for a strong body of believers accomplishing the impossible because you make all things possible. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.